everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Social Z Franchise Happy Hour. I'm the host as usual, and today I am not in beautiful Destin, Florida. I, I think this is our second episode from our place in Northwest Arkansas, so I'm still up here, but it's still very hot. It's 91 degrees today. Did a lot of sweating trying to stay inside, but um, enjoying the summer up here. Very excited to have our next guest, Miss Shauna, like Shauna Na Jefferson, <laughs> coming from humble, not humble, Texas. Shauna, how are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Calvin? Good, good. So excited to get to talk to you and hear a lot about your very interesting and, and, and successful journey to where you are. Um, to kick us off for the first 60 to 120 seconds, tell us what you're reading or doing for personal development right now. Oh, gosh. Okay, so I've just started. I'm a, I am listen to audiobooks and podcasts all the time. Mm -hmm. So I just started reading or listening to a, a book, and I'm going to screw up the title, but I it, think it's the 40,000 week or some hour year or so the whole point of the book is really he's debunking all of the myths about uh productivity and time management and mm -hmm. it's all about shaping reshaping how we view time and hopefully that helps us to better use our time and to um make better choices as to how we use our time. So um, it's actually very eye-opening. It's not a very long um, audio book, only about five, five and a half hours, but I've sure. so far it's been very eye-opening. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I read one many years ago, Shauna, uh, it was called The Four-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. If you've never read any uh, Tim Ferriss, he actually has you know something that you might be interested in. He has a, a cookbook as well. Um, oh, I think it's called the I think it's called the Four Hour Chef, maybe. Um, but that's <laughs> worth worth checking out, also. Um, but yeah, um, I imagine with everything that you have going on, time and productivity management is very very important. Um, so to to kick us off, I guess tell us you know tell us what you have going on now, what you spend your time on, and a little bit about your brand, and then we'll circle back and hear how you got there. Okay. So I am the franchise owner, uh, uh, an owner of Chefs for Seniors franchise, and uh, I cover the entire northern northern Houston area, and then I also have a territory in the southeast Houston area in those suburbs. And so I have a team of chefs who work for me, and what we do is we improve seniors' lives through food. So on any given day, uh, I am I may be in the kitchen. I currently only cook for three clients. Um, the franchisor actually gave me some excellent advice uh, when I first started. And he said, okay, Shauna, the goal is to hire as many, hire, start hiring as soon as possible because the sooner you get out of the kitchen, the sooner you can start working on your business instead of in your business. Sure. And mm -hmm. I, I took their advice to heart. So I have a team of about 14 or 15 chefs who oh, wow. work for me part time. And so I spend uh, a lot of time basically texting, calling them, making sure they've got what they need, uh, scheduling with clients. Uh, I spend a lot of time networking with other individuals in the senior service industry, uh, doing food demonstrations uh, with at uh, senior uh, apartment complexes, uh, different organizations. I do senior nutrition talks. Um, I'm also spending time now trying to figure out how I want to branch out and actually create a brand for myself, a Chef Shauna brand, uh, sure. really focusing, really focusing on uh, senior nutrition and uh, cooking for cooking tips for seniors and things like that. Uh, so I've got a lot of different things that I'm currently that I'm currently working on. Um, but the bulk of my time is really spent on uh, growing the my Chefs for Seniors North and Southeast Houston uh, brand and uh, helping to improve the lives of as many seniors as possible through food. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Shauna, we want to hear more about that, your your brand and what you're doing and then also your plans to, to develop your own brand. We want to talk about that. Let's go, go way back. Where did you grow up? 
um, you know, where did you go to school at? And when did you first know that you were going to be an entrepreneur? So I grew up in Houston and I am actually the oldest child of two small business owners. So I, awesome. I was, I was raised in a household. My, my parents never worked for anybody else my entire life. Mm-hmm. So, uh, my dad started off owning his own, starting his own insurance agency. And then he decided to pursue his love of cooking. And so he started his first restaurant when I was two and he gave the insurance business to my mom. And so she did that for uh, over 35 years. And he actually owned several restaurants throughout his career. And uh, he, he, eventually narrowed it down to one and he was in business for almost 47 years. Oh, so wow. I can honestly say I watched him and he never worked a day in his life. I, he, he did what he, he did what he loved. So that mm-hmm. was, um, that was, uh, my exposure to the restaurant business. I grew up in it. Sure. I grew up listening to my dad, give me lectures on, on how you don't want to work for anybody else. The only way you're ever going to have true freedom is working for yourself. and I would sit there and nod my head and say, yeah, yeah. But I watched the sacrifices, you know, that he made, the mm-hmm. long hours, things like that. And I just told him, I said, Daddy, I want a cushy job in corporate America. I'm <laughs> <laughs> trying to, I'm really, I'm really not trying to go down, go down this road. But I have to admit, my very first job out of college, I actually uh, went to undergrad at the University of Texas in Austin. So hook them mm-hmm. horns. And uh, I'm one of those rare people who, when I finished college or before I finished college, I told my parents, I prepared them, I'm not getting a job in Texas. Texas is not the center of the universe, uh, unlike what a lot of Texans believe. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to branch out and live someplace else. So I did not interview anywhere in Texas, which guaranteed I would not get a job anywhere in Texas. So sure. I actually ended up taking a job with uh, AT&T in Atlanta, and I'd interned with AT&T uh, for five mm-hmm. summers while I was in college. And so I moved to Atlanta after I finished college and uh, worked in corporate America there for AT&T, but it was always my goal to become an attorney. And so the the plan was me for, for me to work for three years, move back here to Texas, and go to law school here in Texas. But... I started making money and had a 401k and all that sort of, all those sorts of things. So when I got ready to take my LSAT after about two, two and a half years, I found out that there was an excellent program at Georgia state in Mm -hmm. uh, downtown Atlanta and that they had a part-time legal program. So I broke my parents' heart and decided to, to stay in Atlanta. I continued to work for AT&T and went to Georgia state at night. Mm -hmm. And so I became a lawyer after four and a half years and I quit working at AT AT&T and went into the practice of law full time in uh, downtown Atlanta for a national firm. I did that for about four years. And at that time, I'd been in Atlanta for about seven years. And um, I was just getting tired of the big city, tired of commuting. And so, no, I guess I'd been in Atlanta a little longer than that. But I decided I needed a change and I Hmm. actually went to Savannah on vacation um, one year and I fell in love with it. And I joke because I went for my birthday, which was at the end of August. It was hot. It was humid. There were mosquitoes. It felt like Mm -hmm. Houston, you know, (laughs) it felt like home. And so, but I, I fell in love with it and I was working with a recruiter at that time looking to make a change. And it just so happened that this recruiter happened to, represent the largest law firm in Savannah and ended up uh, getting a uh, getting an offer there. And so I moved to Savannah and lived there for seven years and uh, practiced law and was very involved in the community. Lots of nonprofits, volunteer work. And actually, that's where I met my culinary mentor other than my dad. His Mm -hmm. name is Chef Joe Randall, and he had a little cooking school called Chef Joe Randall's Cooking School, Cooking School. He focused on Southern cuisine and um, I used to take his classes and he and his wife just kind of took me under their wing. They adopted me and he basically taught me everything that I later in 
ended up quote unquote learning in my very first class in culinary school. Once I got to class and I looked at the book, I was like, oh, Chef Joe already taught me all of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So you were you were you were doing that and you were going to culinary school while you were still working as an attorney full time? So no, these were just I would just take I would just sign up and take a, a course here and there. He would he would okay. have class he would have these you could sign up at night and he'd do a five course meal and he'd give you the recipes and there were about twelve people from all over the world actually because a lot of people Savannah has a lot of tourists and so I would just um sign up to um do one of his dinners but then I did an intensive twelve week class with him. So um about 10 years ago, I was in a rut, decided I needed to change. My parents were getting older. I mm -hmm. didn't want to have to get on a plane if something happened to them. And sure. I, I wanted to enjoy them while they were still in good health. And so I made the decision to relocate back to Houston. I needed a break from practicing law. Uh, I was a, actually a legal recruiter for a year, and it wasn't my cup of tea. But sure. It was it was actually great experience because it was a year of sales experience, a year of calling people and having them tell me no. So it, it definitely uh, gave me a thicker skin for uh, rejection. And at mm -hmm. that time, I asked my dad, said, hey, it was a hard sell. But I asked him if I could at least come in and learn the restaurant business, help him manage his business. The plan at that time uh I never knew I wanted to own a restaurant, but the plan at that time was to learn the business. And I was actually thinking about um, actually going into uh, restaurant law and I thought it would be mm -hmm. a great combination. I'd have the practical experience of actually managing a restaurant to go along with my legal expertise. And so I thought that would make me much more marketable to restaurant sure. owners as a lawyer. And uh, it, but it was always on my bucket list to go to culinary school. So uh, once again, the whole part time thing. I actually found a culinary school uh, at San Jacinto College. Uh, they have mm -hmm. a culinary program, and I enrolled. I enrolled there part time, and so I managed his restaurant. And during the day, and I went to culinary school in the evenings, or sometimes, you know, during the day. I mean, heck, when it's your business, you kind of fit it in however you want to. Sure. So I I did that for uh, for five years, and so the transition into chefs for seniors. So in 2015, it's my very first uh, year of culinary school. I was driving home one night. I was listening to NPR and NPR did a segment on chefs for seniors. And really? yeah. I was totally captivated because at that point in time, I was really starting to think, okay, well, what do I want to do? If I want to focus on culinary full time, what is it that I would want to do? And even when I practice law, I would, I would like, um, cook five course meals and invite my friends over just because and <laughs> you're I just, a good friend. Yeah. I, yeah, I just loved watching them, you know, enjoy mm -hmm. food and we, we talk and things like that. I'd spend four or five hours every weekend. I do all of my meal prep. And this was before meal prepping was the end thing to do. I would, it was my therapy time. It was very therapeutic for me. I prepare breakfast, lunch, dinner for, for the entire week mm -hmm. and just put it all in my refrigerator I worked long hours, and so I wanted to actually have something healthy and ready for me when I got home as opposed sure. to stopping for fast food. So I began sure. to think about the personal chef thing because that was something that I like to do. And when I heard about Chefs for Seniors and what they did, I said, oh, this is perfect. It's a way of doing well by doing good. So I went to their website, and at the time, they were not franchising. They were just in a, a, a family family. Um, owned company and they were only in Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago, Illinois, and in Florida. Uh, so I said, okay. And there was nothing. I looked for something similar in the Houston area. There wasn't anything. So I um, just continued in culinary school and I would check their website about every six months. I didn't know what I was looking for. Franchising really never occurred to me. It was more for me just motivation and encouragement that, okay, there is something out there. Yeah. Uh, for me. And I finished culinary school in December of 2017. And in June of 2018, I checked their website and they were franchising. Oh, and I filled out the form and the rest is history. So I'm coming up on five years, five years now being a being a franchise owner. And I was one of their early, 
earlier franchises, probably definitely like 18 or 20. And now they're up to somewhere in the mid 80s, I think, really? as far as franchises. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, um, so that's my that's my road from being an attorney <laughs> to being a chef and owning my own business. Yeah, th that's definitely not a straight line, Sean, no. by any means. That's meant to be. <laughs> that's, well, that's great. So, you know, interesting, interesting background. You know, you got your, your degree, your undergraduate and, and worked in finance in the corporate world, went to law school, then culinary school. And, and now you kind of own a business that um, seems to fit a lot of those parts. When, you know, back in 2018, Sean, when you when you started this business, what were the things that you were surprised that you were really good at? And what are the things that you were surprised that you weren't very good at? Um, hmm. I was actually surprised at how good I was at managing people. Um, yeah. Only because I had done it for five years uh, with my dad and I'd done it in corporate America, things like that. But it's very different when you're the business owner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was actually surprised at how much easier it was. <laughs> <laughs> After right. um, managing people in restaurants, I think it's probably one of the hardest businesses to be sure. to be a manager in. And I actually was surprised at how well it prepared me to actually manage uh, manage my chefs with chefs for seniors. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, if I had not had that experience, I think it would have been much more difficult. Uh, much more cool. difficult. So uh, that's actually one thing. The thing I was surprised at how easy it was. The thing I that I was surprised at that has been the most difficult for me, considering I minored in accounting and I have a background in finance. I quickly, quickly, quickly discovered that I hate QuickBooks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So that actually, I actually struggled with. And then finally, I just said, okay, the very first, the very first um, person that I hired was somebody to be a bookkeeper. Yeah. So it is interesting that you weren't as good or maybe you just didn't enjoy the finance piece of it. You think that's what it was? Like you were excited about the other pieces. And so you decided that, you know, I'm going to hire for my weakness on the, the, the accounting, the QuickBooks side. So you can focus on the things that you do enjoy. Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I'm I'm definitely a numbers person and I know I recognize the importance of knowing my numbers and ratios and things like that, but just doing that work to get there, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want somebody to just hand me the end product and then I go from there. Sure, sure. You know, you mentioned you mentioned you worked a year as a uh recruiting recruiting in the attorney field and you didn't enjoy that i imagine a lot of what you do now is recruiting chefs so has that experience helped you and do you enjoy the recruiting the chefs more than you did recruiting the and the, the the law sector the law sector well it's yeah. a little it's a little different i think what i didn't like about the recruiting is first of all um, believe it or not i'm an introvert and okay. so being on the phone constantly all day long call 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 it it just wore me out it, it just really sure. really it just really really wore me out and it's very different though from being on the phone as a lawyer because i was on the phone all the time most of my clients were not local and so uh and i was a transactional lawyer i was not uh, a litigator so i spent a lot of sure. time on the phone there as well but it was a little different it was i could plan those calls um I spent a lot more time read read documents, mark them up, negotiate on the phone. Read documents, mark right. them up, negotiate them on the phone. So it's a little different. Um, recruiting chefs is actually uh, very different from being a recruiter on the phone. But there are some things that are similar. Uh, I'm able to quickly evaluate a chef's resume, uh, evaluate their background. Uh, so that experience actually does help me from a hiring from a hiring perspective, um, and actually sure. that experience that experience as a recruiter actually helps me on the sales side of things too. Just because um, 
there was a book I came across when I was a recruiter that that I read and it was very helpful. And they actually have a website. It's called Go for No. And the whole point okay. is the more no's you go for, eventually you will get to the yes. So um, that actually helps me out on the sales side of what I do in recognizing that this there are a lot, I'm going to hear a lot more, a lot more no's than I will hear yeses as far as wanting to wanting to utilize, utilize my service. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sean, I do want to spend some time talking more about about your brand and and, you know, what, what you do specifically. So for those of us that are not aware of Chefs for Seniors, you know, what's how does the business model work and what is the value add for the chefs and what's the value add for the customers? OK, so the business model is that we provide personal chefs to seniors who are unable to cook for themselves or who are just tired of cooking. And so. Our model is different from food delivery or for Meals on Wheels because we actually deliver the chef and the chef actually grows into the client's home, spends about two and a half hours in their kitchen, um, prepares really? four dishes. And from those four dishes, the client ends up with about 10 to 12 servings. Uh, we package them, label them, put them in the refrigerator, clean up the kitchen. And yeah. the other value, the the other value add to it, which I think is just as important as the food we prepare, is the companionship piece. Sure. So that's why we don't do meal delivery, because the companionship piece is just as or sometimes more important than than the food. And mm -hmm. so and that's and it's wonderful. Um, the value add for my chefs is I have all of my chefs are part time. They all work doing something else. Uh, during the day, most of them. And the feedback I get from my chefs who actually do maybe work in restaurants or in, in assisted living or something that's a more traditional culinary position is that cooking for our clients, they enjoy it. For them, it's, it's relaxing because they're actually just being able to go into someone's home, spend time with them and cook and do what they love. Sure, sure. Absolutely. And, and so it's great to, to know that I'm able to employ individuals and provide them with an opportunity to really explore their craft and do something, do something that they love. And they just happen to also get paid for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Shauna, we are running out of time here. So mm -hmm. I do want us to wrap up. We really appreciate you sharing your story. And again, it's, it's very unique. I don't know that we will talk to anyone else this year that has <laughs> that, that quite a diverse background, but thank you so much for sharing. And it, it, it does seem like that NPR segment that you heard one day kind of determined what you were meant to do with, with your family's background. And, and then your background is very, very interesting. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, to wrap us up, we will ask you to give us your 60 second elevator pitch. For Chef for Seniors and anyone that took the time to listen to Shauna's story, thank you so much. Hope you join us on the next episode. So, Shauna, whenever you're ready. Okay. At Chefs for Seniors North and Southeast Houston Metro, our mission is to improve seniors' lives through food. So, in a nutshell, some companies deliver the meals, we deliver the chefs. And so, our goal is to help seniors to maintain their independence and improve their quality of life by pairing them with a professional chef that will prepare meals in the comfort of their home and provide companionship while we while they cook. And so once again, our mission is to improve seniors' lives through food and to allow them to age in place. And Shauna, how do we find you? You can find me at my website, chefsforseniors.com uh, forward slash north dash southeast dash Houston. Or you can call me at 832-956-1848 or email me at Shauna at chefsforseniors.com. Awesome. Shauna, that was great. Thanks so Thanks. much for joining us. We appreciate you. you taking the time. 